you're live. Hey, welcome to Wednesday. I'm Sandra Funk from House of Funk, and this is Design Sips. Cheers. Cheers. I have an ice cube in my wine. Yeah, why don't you tell us what you're drinking if you know? Not a clue. Some <laughs> Chardonnay that wasn't cold enough, and therefore I put humongous cocktail ice cubes in it. Um, you know, we do what we can, people. Sometimes we're going to talk about how to avoid overwhelm today in running a design business. Um, but case in point, when your Chardonnay is not cold, get an ice cube and get over it. <laughs> can't fuck the small stuff. No, you really can't. All right, that's Especially the end of that lesson. Have a good one. No, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, we have lots of people joining. Decor by Beth, Fabric hello. Shield, Antique Design, Connecticut. Ooh. Hello, hello. Hello. Mm, I love antiquing in Connecticut. Good stuff. T Tana by Design. Lots of designers joining. Nice to see you all. Cheers to Wednesday. My favorite day to um, get together and talk about design and mostly the business side of interior design. Um, so I know you all know I'm a lifelong learner. I'm constantly reading something, doing some program, hanging out in some mastermind, meeting with a business coach. La, 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 la. And I was listening to some... Um, to a, pro a program, program, of course. Thank God Sarah Harris is here. <laughs> I was listening to a program recently and they were talking about like the very, very complicated nature of being an interior designer. And I couldn't agree more. Um, we have got to be, um, we have to have a knowledge of so many different things. We have to have uh, the ability to kind of think on our feet, run programs, run schedules. You obviously have to have the eye for design and that creativity as well. Um, but pr so much of what we do is, you know, pricing a project appropriately, project management, um, overseeing, you know, how we're gonna go from empty room to gorgeous space or empty lot, gorgeous build. Um, it's layers and layers and layers of details and knowledge and, um, it can be overwhelming. So we are going to talk a little bit about how to keep it all together when, um, as I said in my newsletter, if you're not on the list, please jump on, but how to keep it all together when it's going off the rails. Cause some days it feels like it might go off the rails. Yep. And we have the rules of design tips is that you can ask any design related questions throughout the whole episode and we will answer them at the end. Captive audience, camera in front of me, wine in hand, ask away. We will um, keep an eye and circle back and ask, answer your questions. Um, if you give us something meaty enough, we might just do our whole design sips based on your questions. So fire away. No question too big or too small. Yep. And I do want right. to say a shout out hello to two Nancys, Nancy Mignon and Nancy Ganzik. Ganzik Alper. Yes. Hi. Welcome. Hello, everybody. So and good nice to have you everyone. here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so avoid overwhelm. So what does overwhelm look like for you? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, overwhelm looks like to me, um, there's this moment where I am just re-reading and rereading my to-do list instead of actually doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> and then I know that I have a little bit too much on my plate where I can't even see where to start. So... Um, I know we're going to go through the points, but mm -hmm. I know if I've read through my to-do list for the day, and I kind of sort by due date, if I've read through my to-do list for the day twice and I haven't actually started doing anything, that it's time to get serious and get delegating. My number one, number one tip for overwhelm is to say, um, you know, if I have a bunch of tasks in Asana assigned to me from a team member that are asking like all these little nitpicky questions, then I might just say, hey, why don't we jump on a call and handle all of this? Instead of me trying to like read and catch up and figure out like, why don't we just connect and get through it? And so that helps a lot to just mm -hmm. like take a big chunk of like, this is really a conversation and it's not going to be effective time-wise for me to kind of like try to parse through and figure out what you're asking here. Um, and then tons and tons of times there's things coming back to me that maybe I've written or I've had a conversation about, and it's coming back to me for a final look before it goes out into the world. And at some point, you have to make a decision to stop um, being the, the bottleneck. Yes, bottleneck. Thank you. 
all the words are lost to me today. Mm -hmm. Um, at some point you have to say, my team is amazing. I trust them. And like I said the other day, uh, we had some content that was coming yeah. back through and I said, listen, I'm never getting to this. I trust you. I know you're amazing. If you feel like you want another set of eyes on it before it goes out into the world, tap one of these XYZ resources. So, yeah. um, another, we'll get to it, but another amazing way to avoid overwhelm is to Find ways to scale your team because we are a feast or famine kind of industry, right? You finish a huge job and it's it feels different the couple of last weeks of a huge job to the couple of weeks before you've kind of filled all that time because, you know, that time needs to get filled. So that feast and famine way of interior design or that really busy period right before you go to bid, right? Where you're getting all the bid packets ready and every detail or right before detail design when you're putting every proposal together, you're dotting all the I's, you're checking every price, you're checking every CFA, every item number. Those times are like the crazy crunch, right? So we've found ways to work with freelancers, interns, um, Freelance, 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 right? Yeah. So like really have these second set of eyes that are out there to give us that support in those crunch crunch times when we need it. Um, so we're gonna be talking more and more and more about that scalable workforce, that team basis, that collaborative approach. Um, something that has kind of smacked us in the face in the COVID world, but something that I've been doing research on and leaning into for years and years and years, the, the need to be nimble um, and to be not location nailed down specific as well. Okay, Sandra off the rails right this very moment. Yeah. So delegating, um, so I know I'm in overwhelm when I can't seem to start. Right. I'm just too much in the busyness. Mm -hmm. So a quick connect versus a whole bunch of little back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Same thing with an email. The old adage is if it's gone back and forth like more than twice, pick up the phone and just get through it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that same thing can be happening in your task list where somebody can just be like pinging you this one little itty bitty question and ping and ping and ping and nobody's ever completing anything. They're just kind of batting this thing around. So we don't want to like act like cats. We want to like grab it, complete it, and finish it. Um, scaling, delegating... Oh, and then one of my favorite things to do when I'm ping, when my head is spinning and I can't get it straight is I have this, it was a sample. It was, it's a piece of um, glass that's reverse painted white and it could be anything. It could be a large sticky note. It could be um, scrap paper, uh, clipboard to your right. But I love to write down the three things I need to get done today, somewhere visual where I can see it. I also have a spot for that at the top of my timesheet. So it's the company mission statement to keep me on task. It's the top three things I need to do today. And then the, you know, 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. timeline so that I can write in what I worked on today. We track all the time. Um, that kind of focus helps me not get stuck in the weeds, responding to email, staring at my task list, and getting big, moving big, big things forward instead of getting stuck into little details. Yeah. Definitely. Those are all such good tips. So cheers to that. Cheers. And uh, comment below what over, how do you know when you're in overwhelm? Is it yeah. just looking at the same list over and over? Because I can definitely relate. Yeah. Yep, yep, um, yep. And then I do want to stay on the point of delegation just for one second. Um, I think empowering your team to say, listen, you can actually make this decision too. Because they, your team might not know um, like, oh, that I had the autonomy to make that yes. decision too. Oh, I love that. Um, so I think, and that, so one of the things that, uh, you've forced me to do over the years, <laughs> um, is we, so we used to do what a biannual review. Yeah. So twice a year I would sit down with every employee and do a review. But the truth is if there's something going on, you need to have a touch base much more regularly than six months, right? Because if something kind of went wrong and you're five months from your touch base where you've got like kind of a planned sit down, that's too long to let it go. Um, so so we instituted and also, also then these six month touch bases seemed like they had to be so special and so <laughs> thorough. And yeah. I don't really, it became like, you know, big scary monsters for some reason. Like I had to go sit down and write like a poetry about how amazing you are as an employee or not just say, hey, I wish you were more detail oriented, but I had to like come up with like a workflow of how to correct your every qualm or like whatever. 
it, it just, it felt like it was too much. So we turned, we switched gears and started doing monthly touch bases. So it's way, way like more chill and it's more timely. So once a month we're saying, how are you doing? Da, da, da. Like it might be that same thing. Like, hey, I see that we are kind of ping pong and things back and forth. Why don't we do this a little, why don't we try something else? Or, or the bigger thing, I want you to make those decisions. Unless you legitimately cannot make that decision, you don't know the answer and you need me as a mentor. Otherwise, go forth and make these decisions. I trust you, I value you, you're a great employee, you've never let me down in the past, you know, like, let's do this. Um, that's really the gateway to, um, to not getting stuck in that rut. Yeah, definitely. And I think another thing that we do is those daily touch bases. So when it's starting to ping back and forth and you're like, this really needs to be a conversation, right. we have optional daily touch bases throughout the, each day. Yes. So I love this as well, especially in the world of a remote team. Um, we're all virtual now. So every day on my calendar, there's time set aside when any team member team member can reach out. They can schedule a Zoom for that time if they want to kind of share their screen and look over floor plans or selections or whatever that is. Um, or they can just pick up the phone and call. So um, it's a great way to stay available to your team but also not being interrupted all day long, right? So that I know I'm going to kind of come up for air. I'm going to make sure I'm available and answering my phone at that time. Yeah, definitely. And it definitely is a trickle down effect. I can look at my list and know, okay, this is something that I'll never be able to communicate over Asana and we'll leave it for an in-person or Zoom with Sandra. So it definitely works. Yeah, it's very helpful. And um, making yourself available to your team helps them be more efficient. It helps them not get mm -hmm. stuck in their own overwhelm. Um, another thing that we do a lot that we talk about a ton is that I know that our workflow goes like this, right? And I want my team to know that I know that, right? And then I empower them to, do you think you're going to need an intern this coming semester? Do you, you know, here's the freelance company that we work with. They're amazing. And they have all these different kind of people that do different kind of things. It's like virtual assistants for interior designers. Um, please, you're, I don't, I'm not looking for you to do all nighters. I'm not looking for you to work all weekend long. If you feel you need to, to be an A plus, then okay. But that is not the company culture that I am running in any way, shape or form. I want balanced long-term employees. I don't want to burn everybody out. So if you're getting to that point where you have too much to complete on your plate, here are the resources. Here's, you know, here's the list of, you know, intern options. Here's the stack of resumes that we've been sitting on. Here's the freelancers that you can reach out to. Like, figure it out, you know? And so then you're training future managers, right? You're, you're empowering them to make decisions. Um, you're making yourself available when they need your input and you're showing them how to, um, handle their own workflow and their own workload without asking too much of them and, um, really giving them that, them that empowerment. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Leslie joined. So hello, Leslie. Hello, sister. What you drinking? Cheers. Cheers. I'm having white wine with an ice cube because it was not cold. <laughs> so to uh, rewind a little bit, mm -hmm. um, I want to kind of go throughout your day of how you, uh, without knowing it, probably avoid overwhelm. So why don't you start with from the moment you wake up, how you get in the mindset for productivity. Yes. So um, it actually starts the night before, of course, as most good mornings Love do. It. So, um, the night before I have my phone charging in the bathroom with my alarm clock set for 5 AM. I have next to that, my ear, AirPods, earbuds, my kids make fun of me. I never know what those things are called. Anyway, <laughs> things you put in your ears that give you music or podcasts or trainings is, is my case. Um, then I have my whatever workout outfit gear laying there on the floor next to, uh, you know, my socks, the whole gig, anything you're going to need to go out. I have my, um, I grab my lotion from my counter and make sure I leave it in there. And when my alarm goes off at five, I literally, my goal is to not think until I'm in my workout gear and walking down the stairs. Oh, that's what I was going to say. My water bottle's filled and sitting there next mm -hmm. to my phone and my earbuds and my outfit. So like by the time I've 
gotten the alarm off and gone to the bathroom, I'm changing. Like it's like it's next to, you know, like right. Don't even pull your pajamas back up. Just take them off. It's you're not putting them back on, you're not going back to bed. <laughs> and if you can get into like this auto motion where it's all just there for you and it's laid out, I am literally walking out of my house with my earbuds in and my water bottle in hand before I have like a thought about I should go back to bed because it's just not even available. So then I'm out walking and doing my like movement piece. I come back in, I do um, a 20 minute meditation, which is so, so incredibly grounding and helpful to kind of stay calm. And it is the number one thing to avoid over overwhelm, right? Um, I love Robin Sharma's, uh, I think it's the 5 a.m. club, mm -hmm. and it's move, meditate, learn. I wish that last one was an M2, but it's not. Um, so get up and move in the morning if that's a yoga class, if that's just walking when the weather's decent, that's my favorite. Um, meditate, sit in silence at least 20 minutes, um, and just, maybe it's not silence. I do a lot of um, chanting, you know, meaningful chants to me. You, you do you, figure out what it is for you. Um, and then learn. And so sometimes I combine the learning with the walking because I love to put um, a course in my earbuds and or AirPods or whatever the hell those things are called. And I like to learn while I'm walking because that, that just, you know, efficient. Um, and then you're up and off. Like your day is you're ready to rock. And I'm out of the shower, dressed, you know, having coffee and um, my morning zone bar because that's the creature of habit that I am before anyone else is even up and that is key. So if I have something that's like crazy critical or more often than not a passion project that I am having a hard time finding time for, that time between getting out of the shower and everyone else needing me is mine and that's huge. Um, and I find that if I put on my workout gear and say I'm going to take a break in the middle of the day and go for my walk and do my meditation, my family is up, my dog is up, my people are up, my husband is up. Like it, it just becomes the day takes it away. That takes me away. So um, read the book over some point early, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago yeah. and have been, I couldn't be more dedicated to the idea that it's the truth. Like. The days that I am up and do that routine, I am a better person all day long. It's just incredible. So um, it sounds crazy and everyone who knows me knows that I am like a night owl, but um, this is this is a very, 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 very grounding and um, energizing, really. Yeah, and I think anything. people think maybe this conversation would be about strategies which we're all going to give in your business like your task management but when you're an entrepreneur it everything is intertwined yes and yes. so having well, that mindset especially a covid entrepreneur yeah um it's extra intertwined like right now in my schedule i have i think a two-hour block in the middle of the day just blocked off where i'm not available to take meetings i'm not available to my team um it is for me to make sure that my kids have lunch change over the laundry. You know, we're all kind of on our own. We used to have all this help, right? We used to have people who were helping with the children, people who were helping the home. We're really doing a lot different than we were before. So it's this time for me to, to be present with my family, to be present as a homemaker, someone who takes care of the home, right? If it's running an errand or whatever, like I did take both of my girls separately to Target because I guess I could have taken them both, but then it would have just been everyone screaming at each other because they wanted to go in two different directions. That's another way to avoid overwhelm. Spend true, true quality time with each member of your family separately because um, we've had a lot of togetherness. A lot. So, yeah. Um, but that two hour block in the middle of the day seems crazy pre-COVID, but in this world, it saves me. I mean, I'm not going to put a load of laundry in or um, go water the plants at the end of a very long day. I'm, but if I set myself up for a schedule that works for me and I get to go enjoy the sunshine and be outside or like run a few errands and just get up and get out, you know, um, it, it's been really, really huge, really helpful. So looking at your schedule and creating this ideal schedule for yourself, um, permission granted. Why not? Right. If not now, when? Mm. Cheers. Cheers to that.
right? Yeah, and if things aren't right or the way they should be at home in your personal life, and this is for anyone, it will trickle into your business and it will trickle down to everyone's, the, the way everyone works and affect your bottom line. I really oh, do absolutely. believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because it's it's about headspace, right? So that's, I think, one of the big things. The um, That little thing of, I haven't worked out yet today. I should work out. I should go for a walk. I haven't worked out yet today. Like, if you get up and do that morning routine, it's done. Like, you have mental, you have additional headspace that's not related to that. So same thing. If, if you're, you know, if you got your children a healthy lunch and you cleaned it all up and you prepped dinner and you made sure that you're set up for success in your family life, just like you're set up for success in your personal life, just like you're set up for success in your business, all that spinning, all the extra stuff that's running around in your head that makes it so hard to just take the next task and execute. Yeah, exactly. Um, Leslie wrote, I try and only have meetings on Wednesday and Thursday so I can be with the kids on Fridays and actually get work done on Monday and Tuesdays. See? That's looking at your life and making a plan. Chunking it down. I love that. It's so funny. My outward facing days are Wednesday, Thursday as well. Those are my preferred days to, you know, like uh, this is like wash and dry (laughs) and curl hair. That's not a daily practice, people. I've got things to do. Yeah, no, messy bun and uh, really cozy clothes is is very standard around here. Yeah, and I do think we should talk about your ideal calendar. So Sandra today already had like a mastermind call and was going to have a PC meeting today and then tomorrow's booked with a podcast interview. Like she, we have set up her calendar for these outward facing things. Yep. And they dovetail well with like my headspace. Like Mondays, I am always going to be tackling like all catching just, up. It feels like a catch up day, right? It feels like I've been off for two days. There's things I needed to get done. I often will do, um, I will do catch up work over the weekends in because I like to. It's that it's so funny on Saturdays and Sundays. If I'm working on something, it's because I want to, right? So Monday, it might be taking that bit of work that I did and getting it to the right team member, or you know whatever that looks like, um, catching up, catching up, checking all those emails. Cause I definitely try to give myself some distance from those over the weekend. So, yeah. And yeah. so in your, your calendar, we block, um, those two bl- hours in the middle of the day. Um, but we also have blocks for just standard items and just PR right. and just clients. So it helps right. to block that time ahead. Oh, it's so great. And to know that I have like a PR block. And for me, that means like reviewing social media, reviewing newsletter content, looking at any partnerships or speaking engagements we have coming up, prepping for the next design sips, what the topic's going to be, if there's a guest, making sure I'm up to date on their bio and all their information, maybe listening to a few podcasts that they've done or reading their latest info. So having blocks of time that you have regular repeatable tasks that are going to happen and kind of placing them in the best Like our PR block is on Friday because it starts to feel like, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't really want to be, um, you want to do something a little lighter, brighter. Um, don't want to be in your finances. Yeah. You don't (laughs) want to be checking. Right. And then like checking finances is more of like a Tuesday activity for me. It's like, okay, just suck it up and grind it out. And that's very Mars and that's very Tuesday. And so that's the, um, you know, and I'm all about the days and the cycles and the moons and the world and so the things. I, talk about it. I think, yeah. why, don't, why don't you say why we do those outward facing things on Wednesdays and mm-hmm. Thursdays for you? So Wednesdays are Mercury. Um, and if you, like Mercury is more outward facing, right? So it's more um, communication and speaking and public appearance. So it just comes more naturally on that day. Monday is the moon and that's yourself. And so Mondays are more about internal. It should be about self-care, but let's be honest. I don't know why not one salon or nail place is open on a Monday and it's supposed to be the self-care day, but at the very least it's best, you know, if you can, you know, draw a bath, take a, take a soak on a Monday. It's really good for just like a little extra self-care. So if that just means, you know, putting on extra lotion before bed or giving yourself a little facial or whatever that looks like, a little self-care on Mondays. Tuesdays are about just um, Mars and they're about like 
putting your nose to the grindstone and getting it done. Mars is very militant and very strong and very kind of um, like a little more aggressive energy. And so it's like, it's a good day to just bang stuff out. Thursday is Jupiter. It's about expansion. So, right. Um, anything that Jupiter is kind of close to expands. So it's a great day again for being out in the world, for meeting with potential clients, networking, um, networking, 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 <laughs> you know, being in a format like this where you're trying to expand your horizons and you're trying to um, grow your business. And then Fridays are gone from my mind. What are Fridays? Oh, Venus. Hello. Um, so Fridays are about love and connection, and so it's a great day um, to kind of connect with your family, connect with your team, express uh, your appreciation for those that you love. Saturday is Saturn, and it's so funny because they don't always line up. Saturn is about the things you must do. It's about obligation. So again, sometimes I'll do some work on a Saturday, and it's those things that need to get done. And so... Think about that on Saturday. Think about how you're feeling, right? Um, and then Sunday is about the sun, right? And so um, that is all about, again, it's it's more, um, it's about the self a little bit, and it's more about who you are and who you want to be, so it can be reflective and very, I don't know, like sun salutations, right? Like more about kind of taking care of yourself. Mm. Those are my days. Um, so that was lengthy, but what I guess what I'm saying is that there's like a deeper rhythm mm -hmm, to it mm -hmm. and whatever your beliefs are or whatever you connect with, um, it, it might be that you're tired on Fridays because you like to go out on Thursday nights and it, it might be um, that Mondays you're tired because you do a big Sunday dinner with your family. Like whatever that looks like for you, um, just see the rhythm in it, notice it and schedule accordingly. Yeah, love it. All right. And I feel like a lot of people just want, you are getting a lot of hearts doing that one. Cheers. Oh, thanks, guys. Uh, Claire Jefford joined. So hello, Claire. Hi, Claire. So a designer asked, what are your tips on prioritizing when you have multiple concurrent clients? Um, well, every client is important. Um, we have kind of an overall pipeline calendar that we put all of our clients into. So we're careful to make sure that we don't have um, huge, you know, again, our workflow goes like this always. So we're careful to make sure that we don't have huge busy times overlapping between two clients because so we'll just shift them off a week from each other. And we can see that when we're scheduling the project at the very beginning of the project so we can edit our start date you know we, we can sign them on and get started with their design questionnaire and with all their intake and everything and setting up our day to measure the space and all of that so we might move our date available dates to measure the space out a week if we want to make sure that we offset them um, we're very careful to look at that from the very beginning of scheduling so that we don't run ourselves into a situation where we have major installs or major presentations like kind of competing with one another in multiple clients. Um, depending on the size of the firm, because again, we scale our work, um, we scale our people to our pipeline. Um, we'll, you know, we're also looking at, you know, lead designers could have two big things happening in the same week. It depends on how much involvement I'm going to be in each of those. So um, we're just careful with it. And we really want to make sure that we set amazing expectations and that everyone gives, we give every single client 100% all the way through that project. So we set ourselves up for success right at the very beginning. Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, you're in charge of that schedule. So thanks, Sarah. Yeah, scheduling it's not at, a light thing. Scheduling at front and just being able to look at that, we can say how many presentations will they have right. and going from there. Yeah, is there helps. any major travel, any major speaking engagements? Because that all takes time. Yeah, and energy. And energy. Mostly energy. <laughs> yes. So we have another designer who asks, what are your tips for a solo practitioner? We do it all and overwhelm seems par for the course at this stage. Yes. So being a solo is is so, you know, it, it is, it's everything, right? You're doing all of it. So um, 
I think tips for the solo is to have an extremely clear and defined process that every client is kind of walking through that process so that you can very clearly see what's done and what needs to be done in each separate job. Um, I remember my time as a solo when it was just me and I was a regular 3 a.m. <gasps> Wait, did I ask for a CFA? Did I order that fabric? Did I transpose a number? Did that happen? Is this okay? Wait, did I send a thank you note to that client yet? I can't remember if I, la 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 la, insert here. So long, long ago, I kind of figured out that I needed to make sure every single thing was documented and a really clear way to say this has been completed or not completed. Because one thing that you can't do as a solo is just keep it all in your head because that's when you'll spin and that's overwhelm. So get it out of your head, get it out into a system. I love Asana for that. There's a million other ways. It used to be like a checklist that I would just print for each client. Um, you do you, but um, get that system nailed down and then work that system. We happen to have a system. <laughs> Yes, we've been writing it down for a long time, so we have a very thorough system all written down. And they can find that. Oh yeah, so <laughs> I'm not good at that salesy part. So you can check out our system at interiordesignstandard.com and or houseoffunk.com and then go to the trade tab. And we have a really cool demo module out that goes over our project structure. And so that's our gift to you absolutely free of charge. And then it is also a great way to see a little taste of what the standard looks like on the inside. And inside the standard, we give you every single step in a design project, every template, every thing that we do to make sure that it is a, it is a success from start to finish. She says, ha ha, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, this is the next part of our what we're gonna talk about, but mm -hmm. It really does help you avoid overwhelm and those late night scares of, oh my God, did I do that thing when it's already documented in Asana? Yep. Um, so again, why don't you kind of say like what our Asana template is like, what the skeleton is, what it looks yes. like. Yes. Okay. So our overall process, and again, you're going to see this more clearly if you check out the demo module. It's free. It's at houseoffunk.com. Go to the trade tab. But that process, it starts with like, you know, it starts in the PC module. We have a PC module, which is the potential client. Every step that a potential client goes through with our firm, you know, us educating them on how it is to work with us and all the steps they go through. Once they become a client, they move into our full service Asana template. And in this template, it goes from the administrative tasks to set up a new client. And then we go into conceptual design and it's each and every step that a client goes through to fully understand them, to be able to put together a conceptual design, every deliverable involved, all the details. Once we confirm aesthetic direction, scope, budget, and timeline in the end of conceptual design, we move into detailed design. You all know and love detailed design, right? That's where every single fabric, every single finish, every single tile, grout color, budget, procurement, detail, like every little thing is detailed design. It is so meaty. It is where the bulk of our overwhelm comes from in interior design. It's wrangling every single detail, having it properly quoted, having it in writing, and having it then turned into a proposal that you can put beautifully in front of the client. So that is detailed design. Once we have sign off on that, we move into purchasing and execution. And we go again, really structured. We wanna make sure that we are very careful with our purchasing, very accurate. Every single order that goes out must get acknowledged. We need to make, then we need to stay on our vendors and stay present with them. We need to stay in touch, follow up. Um, if there's one thing I have found is that the squeaky wheel does get the grease and that an unacknowledged order isn't an order. It's just something that you sent out into the ether and it went into a spam file. So, or got lost in the mail, whatever. Um, those, all of those little details, every CFA checked in, every acknowledgement checked, you know, item numbers double checked, just so many little things to keep an eye on. But when you have this locked down, you can sleep at night and, or wake up with like, Eureka, the shower should be pink or whatever design idea that you are now able to focus on because you're not freaking out about whatever those little details are. Yeah, definitely. And another thing that we hear a lot is 
designers not wanting to make their first hire because they don't know how to train even someone on their process. Correct. So a lot of times I see our sole proprietors not moving if they want to. You know, sometimes sometimes they don't want to have that hire and they want it to do it all themselves. But um, when, when they're feeling the pull to hiring, but they're not sure if they're ready and they're not sure if they can, often when you're, when it's time to hire, you're so overwhelmed with work that it's hard to imagine taking the time to train. Mm -hmm. So there's a chicken and the egg thing here that's really important to, um, well, it's part of why the standard is so helpful, right? Because it gives you the structure to literally hand them a new employee, once you have a structure in place that's so clear and so defined, it's very, very easy to onboard a new employee. You literally hand them your login to the standard, have them go through the modules, and they can jump in anywhere you are in the project because they'll know exactly where you are, what's done, what needs to be done next, what's happening. It's it's been an incredible resource, even in our own firm, to have mm -hmm. those videos and those walkthroughs. Um, it's um, it's helping in ways that we didn't even realize it would help us to have as a resource. So, yes, I right, trained very good. two interns and an executive assistant. None of them in the design department with the standard. Yep. So, and it's cut that? my training time. And that's because the standard is not just about design. It's about the business of design. So it's huge for um, someone who's coming in to help. Obviously, um, usually the first hire is administrative, right? They're helping you put together those proposals, place orders, follow up on open orders, um, do bookkeeping, whatever that is. They still need to understand what your process is and how it works and when the invoices go out and what what happens here, there, and wherever. So um, having that structure in place and having it defined is really, really, really huge. Yep. So one more time, it's yes. interiordesignstandard.com. That's it. And enrollment opens only oh. for two weeks. I know. We're so excited. It's coming so soon. So much to do. So September 16th. We mm -hmm. will see you inside the standard. Yes. So September 16th, mark your calendar. Join us, please. We are having so much fun. We just got off of a... Um, kind of little breakout session with some of our designers in the standard, um, just Zoom calls and Facebook groups and growing by leaps and bounds, collaborating, you know, having someone else who totally understands your business because we're not comparing apples to oranges anymore. Once we're all using the same back-end business structure, we're now able to speak about our businesses apples to apples. And we are building a community and a network of designers who believe in abundance, who believe in sharing best practices, who believe that we all rise together when we share and learn and grow together. Um, I just love them. I mean, it's just Me the best. Too. They're so great. Thank you, guys. Okay. Y'all know who you are. So for, I love this question, what about client overwhelm? For those clients that get overwhelmed and insist on multiple options for everything. Or <laughs> okay. emailing you like multiple times a week. Multiple options for everything does not take down the overwhelm. Okay, so simple analogy to tell your clients when they want to see multiple options. I get this all the time. So here's why I can't give you multiple options. If I give you a handful of sofas, a handful of coffee tables, a handful of wallpaper, paint colors, drapery fabrics, yada, that you then have two or three options for everything, then every single thing I'm gonna show you has to be vanilla, right? Because it's plug and play. Every sofa has to look good with every fabric, every end table has to look good with every coffee table. And what that is, my dear friends, is a pottery barn or a restoration catalog, okay? so. You know where to find that. If you want custom, detailed, personalized interior design that's reflective of the needs and wants that you've expressed to me, along with us bringing our aesthetic value and leveling up as, of course, the, all the project management that goes with making it all really occur, then we're going to do a design for you that is very carefully considered and is absolutely custom to fit your specific needs. We're not going to give you options because every one item, you know, sometimes the bed is going to be the big feature and it's going to be very, very special, which means that the wallpaper is going to be supportive, but not the key feature, right? Because if everything is super special, you have the Bellagio and 
well, fun to visit. No one wants to live in the Bellagio. And if everything is super interchangeable and you can just kind of like choose your own adventure, we have Pottery Barn. So interior design is a beautiful, beautiful space between Pottery Barn and Bellagio. And that is why there are no options. We do one round of revisions two times in our projects. So what that means is we will, we will go back and give you a second choice on every single thing that you need to see a second choice on. Layout, budget, um, specific items, whatever. But we need to go back into the think tank. We need that information communicated to us in one communication. We don't do the drips and drabs, right? Because we need to look at it in its entirety. So if we're to switch out the bed and the wallpaper, we're, and the bed is still the feature, then we need this like fabulous other bed option and a supportive, more, you know, supporting cast member as the wallpaper. Um, if you want to switch and make the wallpaper the feature, then the bed needs to chill out, right? So like we're always playing with the full picture. We're not looking at siloed individual pieces. I think great design is about the mix, right? It's not like you're not just always putting in a rectangular headboard and two small squatty nightstands. Like every job is a, is a, is a chance for self-expression for your clients. So you get the beautiful new muse with every single job. And that's what makes this career fun and exciting because your muse is your client. And every time you're creating a new piece of art. So if you can stay in that joy and you can stay loving what drew you to design originally by removing all the other noise, right? This is the staying out of overwhelm. Then I think you can express that to your clients in a way that is very clear that they shouldn't be looking at tons of options every time that you meet. Guys, do you need a little Sandra on your shoulder <laughs> motivating you in times of stress? <laughs> You're in tons of hearts. Oh, uh, yay. Tana says, perfectly stated. Mm -hmm. um, so that thank was you, thank you, thank you. like a Hallmark card written for designers. So Yeah, yeah no, advice. and I and I literally had this conversation with a client the other day. Um, we were Zooming, and um, and they were like, so do we see, are there options? And <laughs> I went through the whole thing, and, and they just smiled because they can see my passion for design and for like that mix. And you have to show that to your clients, so. Yeah, and they have to rem be reminded sometimes that, like, they came to a, a expert and a professional for a reason. Correct. And this is why. Correct. Yep. That's Someone it. Someone says, so need a little Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yours. I'm all yours. Every Wednesday. Yeah, so there's lots of designers joining us right now. Just a reminder, you can comment your questions. Um, we're going to answer a couple more, and then we're going to sign off. So if you have them, comment them now. All We'd right. love to know. Yeah, tell me what you got, and keep them coming, because we might table it and bring it back to you next mm -hmm. week. We love to, um, you know, circle back. Yeah, definitely back. DM us. Absolutely. Okay, so... Uh, Earlier this week, Shelves042 asks, what is the first thing I should do as a young designer to start my own business? So as a young designer starting your own business, um, well, I think the number one thing to do is to go work for someone you admire and just soak up the, the way they get it done. The tools that they use, the resources, the, um, the mindset, right? The outlook. Um, if that's not available to you or you are hot to start your own business, then go find mentors, enroll in courses, take leaps and bounds forward. Um, the, the thing not to do is to toil away, trial and error, make it up as you go, um, wing it. You know, uh, you could spend a lot of time um, losing money in a small business. Those first years are the, there's like this like, thing, right? If you survive five years in business, like you'll probably survive 25. So those first years are hard. And so you really need to, um, set yourself up, up for success. And so, like I said, that could be working for someone that you really, really admire and mirroring and, and, and having that, it could be looking for mentors and it can be things like the standard, which is, I don't know, my obvious answer to that question. Uh, we have one member of the standard that's finishing up their like kind of six months of going through. And 
Um, it was a second career. She's shifting into interior design and she specifically sought out a program that would give her the structure of this new business venture that she was coming into. And I don't know if we've had a louder supporter of the program than this one mm -hmm. woman. She is just incredible. Um, super educated, successful in her other, you know, career where she was headed, but wants, this is the passion that she wants to go forth with, but she's smart enough to know that she shouldn't just fumble around in the dark. So she did the, all of her research and she found us and, um, just, we've just had such, such good results and it's, you know, she's putting a structure in place that has been proven successful over 15 years in business for myself, 20 years in the industry. I did go to work for those other firms. I did learn from mentors. I have taken a gabillion courses and read a million business books. I mean, if I'm not listening to a course or reading a business book, um, I don't know, like I, somebody <laughs> body snatched me, like it's just who I am. I live there. Um, I was saying to someone the other day, I like, don't even understand people who aren't trying to grow. <laughs> like, I don't get it. Um, that's my happy place, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so it's about kind of taking, taking the careful consideration to catapult forward. Yeah, definitely. All day long. Uh, Leslie commented, first step, get the standard. <laughs> so we agree. Yes. Um, well, I think that's a great place to end the episode. And again, you can find out so much more information um, at interiordesignstandard.com. Someone just commented, love how organized the standard has made my process. I've seen what it's like without that structure, and it's like night and day. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so that's great. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Yes, thank you all. Cheers. Happy hump day. Good luck to you. <laughs>